So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ahmaduhu wa usalli ala Rasulil Kareem, amma ba'd. Fa'audhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillahi al-lazhi anzala ala abdihi al-kitaba wa lam yaj'al lahu iwaja. Rabbi shahli sadri wa yasirli amri wa ahlul uqdata min lisani yafqahu qawli amin ya Rabbi. Today, inshallah, I will be discussing Zulqarnain and the Khazariya tribe and its relationship with Ukraine. So, inshallah, I will be able to say things in a logical way, but I have a lot of points to make, and I want to try to make them at the same time as quickly as possible. So I have a lot of things to share. Uh, so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for me to express myself in a way that is logical and coherent and at the same time bringing in together a lot of issues because what I want to say after this, if the if I'm able to make this logical for you, then inshallah what I have to say after this is very, very important, meaning inshallah in the next few days. Okay, let's start with the very basic. The Prophet ﷺ was asked three questions by the Jewish people to confirm if he was a prophet or not. Well, one of the questions was, who is the man who traveled to the east and to the west? And then the Quran describes his travels and gives us signals or signs to where he was. The first travel the Prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says is he went to a place where the sun was going. It was like as if you travel and when you travel you see the sun as if it is going into the going into the sea or into the lake. My personal opinion about this is that it is fresh water because of the word Ain. Fresh water, but it looks murky black. So just keep this in mind. But most people have said Black Sea. Okay, they're nearby each other. This place that uh, is in my mind that fits the description better. Okay. Anyway, at Maghrib time, this place looks black and murky, and it is fresh water because why? Because Allah didn't call it Bahar, which means ocean but Allah called it Ainin Hamiatin. Ain means a a place that is uh has land surrounding it. Okay. Surrounded by land. Either way, their the general geographical location is uh agreed upon. So he goes on one side till he reaches the water. And the sun is setting there and you can see the sun, the body of water is large enough that when the sun is setting, you see it as if it is setting into the ocean. I'm, I'm going to show you a picture of this phenomenon in just a little bit. And then he takes another traveling position to the other side. Where? To where Lam Yajid Sitra, where you find no shelter, where there is no shelter from the sun like a desert type land and then he takes a third trip to where the mountains are so where in the world <coughs> do we have mountains uh, on one side and the desert on the other side and the water on the other side where now some people have said that this is a different planet no, that cannot be because the Quran calls it Al-Ard, the earth, the known earth. And it cannot be another star because why? It is Ashams, the sun. The When you add Al to a word in Arabic, it means it is the known, the proper noun. If Allah meant any sun, a star, an unknown star, Allah would have used the word Shams without Ashams. And al ard instead of al ard, but I'm not discussing that today. That is for another time. So now, inshallah, let us take a look quickly. My first point to consider that the only place in the world from where, and also you may want to consider that the people that are asking the question, they're asking from their general location. Okay, 
And since they were Jews, maybe they were asking from Medina, or they were asking from Israel, or they were just asking in general from what they knew of the world of that time. If you look at the map, you find the Caucasus Mountains, and you find the Caspian and the Black Sea, and then you find the area of Afghanistan and Uzbekistan, this Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, this area where the mountains are. So, just from a general geographical location perspective, it seems that this place over here fits the best, the mountain of the Caucasus and the rivers or the sea uh, on one side, and then the uh, the mountainous areas on the other side. Okay, it's the only place in the earth that fits that description when you're looking from above. Okay, second thing I want to share with you is so one thing to keep in mind this is Lake Sivan. And in Urdu, those of you in Persian, those that know Farsi and Urdu, Saya, Saya means black. And so this is a fresh water in Armenia. A body of water that is large enough. It's the largest fresh water uh, in in the area near the Black Sea. But this one is like Ain, like a well. Okay, and as if the sun is going into the sea, and it, it is looks dark and murky. Okay, so this lake fits the description of the first journey very well. And then the journey to the desert, and then to the mountains. This can only be the area of the Caucasus Mountains, where Zulkarnain, the man, puts up the wall. Okay, let us now continue from here. Let me show you this body of water in Armenia. By the way, this becomes very interesting when you dive deep into the subject. This lake is surrounded by monasteries monasteries okay i will talk about that later but as you can see here this is the black sea so it is right near the black sea okay and so the other thing to consider here is that who asked these questions who asked these questions the jewish people asked these questions to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to confirm if he is truly a prophet. So, where do you think the Jewish people got their question from? Well, they got it from their books. So, the question is, is the word Zulqarnain in their books? And let me show you. Okay, and then just to sum up, I will go back to the Quran so that we're all on the same page. Now, I'll mention that the word Zul, uh, Zulqarnain and Dhalqarnain is mentioned in the Bible in several places, especially uh, many times in the book of Daniel, okay, in the book of Daniel. Now, if anyone has been studying Islamic eschatology, will remember that the book of Daniel was found in the time of Umar radiallahu an, and translated into Arabic by the commandment of Umar, and there's a reason for that. But I'm not going to go into that today. I'm just going to show you the sentence. It is chapter 8, verse 20 is one of the major ones, because it mentions something very important. As for the ox, the one that I saw, it had two horns. This is a dream he saw. Okay, so who saw this dream? Prophet Daniel, Dhalqarnain, I saw an ox with two horns, and he's talking, because the dreams of the prophets are true. فَهُوَ مَلُوكُ الْمَادِي وَالْفَارِسِ And so he is the Maluk, the king of Madi and Faris. He was the one, meaning this person in history, known as Cyrus the Great, who went in these areas, and he combined the empires of Madi and Faris, okay? He combined the areas of Madi and Faris into one empire. Who did that? Zulqarnain. Who did that? 
Cyrus the Great. How do we know that? Well, first I've shown you that the Bible mentions al -Qarnayn. Second, I've shown you that this al is a king who brings together two empires, Madi and Fadis. So, is there a person in history who brings together the kingdoms and the kings of Madi and Fadis? This is the question. So let us now look into that before, because this will all lead to the question of Ukraine and why Ukraine is so important to Israel and what it has to do with one of the three questions that were asked of the Prophet Okay, so now let us look at this. I have entire videos answering these questions. Today I'm summarizing many things. So on Google, I just typed in the words empires of Mede, Persian, who combined by Cyrus the Great. And now Google gave a result. Cyrus the Great was a Persian king. Cyrus created an alliance with Darius, king of Medes, to create the Persian Mede Empire. Together, this alliance conquered the Babylonian Empire. Okay, and if you know about the Babylonian Empire, then that will give you an idea, uh, particularly in reference to the Jews and magic and all the, the works of Shayatin and everything. The Medes were definitely the junior partners in the empire, which became known as simply as the Persian Empire, meaning became one empire. Now, Cyrus the Great also uh, is, so one thing has to be clear, Cyrus the Great, of course, is mentioned in the Bible as what? Zalqarnayn, the one who brings together these empires. He's also the person who frees the Jews to go back, and that at that time they were the Muslims. He was the one who freed the Jews to go back and what? Uh, freed the Jews to go back and uh, have their liberty back in Israel. Okay, so Cyrus is known as the non Masonic or non Messiah Jew. This is the two horns also on Cyrus the Great that are very, that are part of his symbolism. He's the king that had two horns. Okay, so now what have I done so far? Going back to, first let's go back to the Quran. Okay, so we're absolutely clear. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ba'da a'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim May Allah open our hearts to understand this more deeply and more deeply. Yes, Ba'da a'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim Wa yas aluna ka'an dhil qarnayn. O Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they ask you about zul qarnayn. Qul sa'atlu alaykum minhu dhikra. I will give you some information, something to, uh, something about him. Okay. Inna makannahu fil ard. We established him where? On earth, not in some galaxy. Okay. And we gave him the power to do all things. Okay. This atainahu min kulli shayin doesn't mean kulli shayin. Because kulli shayin in its true sense is only for Allah. But of the things that were presented to him. Sababa, a, a means to it. Okay. So he followed those means that were given to him. Hatta idha balagha maghriba shams. Until he reached the setting of the sun. Wajada taghribu. And he found there the setting in a murky black water, a spring, okay, a large body of water that has land all around it, okay. He found a people there. And this is his first trip. Now, second trip, then he followed his means. The word sababa means also to go across the desert. By the way, that's one of the meanings. And the word sababa also means to go to a spring. Subhanallah. And the word sababa also means to pull out water from a well. The word sababa also means to go on top, go upwards, to on like on a roof of a house. Hatta idha balagha matni shams. So he did all three. He went across the desert. He went, I have a whole video on this, the word sababa and what it means and all its meanings. One is to go across the desert, one is to go to, to the sea, one is to go upwards. And so first trip is to, the, uh, is to the desert, sorry, the first trip is to the water, the second trip is to the desert, and the third trip is to the uh, north to the mountains. Hatta idha balagha matli ashams wajadaha he found there a people who had no shelter. Okay. And then he followed his path again. So three journeys. And over there he found a people who 
where uh, when he reached is a, a place there was no uh, barrier. He found between this kind of like a valley where is a mountainous place and he found Ya Dhul Qarnayn, can you protect us from Ya'juj and Ma'juj? This is why we're studying this. The place of Ya'juj and Ma'juj is this place of the Caucasus Mountains. Now, what happens then and then later on? So now I'm going to now switch directions a little bit, but I only wanted to establish the ayat of Quran in what I have said so far. And now we're going to continue to build on this inshallah ta'ala. Okay. Then sometime later, as we will hear this Jewish professor who is very knowledgeable in just uh, a little bit, uh, this area north of the Caucasus, where the Ajuj and Ma'juj, the wall, the Darband wall was put as also confirmed in some of the Ahadis and narrations. But I'm not going to go into the details today. I just want to mention something important uh, about Ukraine and the link to this whole situation. Okay, so there is some fitna. In this case, in this case of Zulqarnain, a fitna is happening in the Caucasus Mountains in this region. Then later time, in a later time, in a later time when the Muslims were an empire, a group of, for some reason, we don't know why, even the Jewish men will say this, but we don't know why, but a group of people north of the Caucasus accepted Judaism and established an empire called the Khazari, the, 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 the Khazari people, okay? And so, if you ask the question, why are there white Jews who speak Yiddish and they're not the Semitic, brown, tan skin like the prophets before who were from Bani Israel, but you find these Jews who are white-skinned, who didn't even speak Hebrew, and now they're settled in Israel, that, so, there's a lot of questions there. Well, one of the answers that many Jews have given themselves is what? That this is the people from the Khazadi tribe. These were people who converted to Judaism and they had, there's a whole process that they went through to become Jews. I'm not going to go into that right now, but these were a Jewish people. And now these Jewish people are the ones that are in, uh, in, in the Jews in Ukraine, the, especially because the Khazadi tribe, the Khazadi empire, it's one of its centers was Kiev, which is the center of Ukraine. Okay, so now you'll see how this is going to go. So freeing the Jews from Russia, which already happened because the third most spoken language in Israel is Russia. And, uh, and now freeing the Jews from Ukraine. Okay, so now uh, we're going to talk about the freeing of the Jews from the north of Ukraine and bringing them to Israel in a little bit. But I want to, you to establish this idea that uh, the Jews of Khazaria, okay, uh, the evidence is mounting uh, that uh, Jews of Khazaria, Jews of Khazaria, these are all different books, okay, the 13th tribe, uh, the Khazars, okay, these were a people, an empire in the Caucasus Mountains that accepted Judaism, okay, and uh, then it seems like they went westward. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. So, where was the center of this Khazari empire? It was in present-day Ukraine. It was in Kiev. And so, let me show you what this Jewish professor says. What this, I'm going to show you about a few clips, one or two clips, about what this Jewish professor says. And then, I will tell you why this is important okay because ukraine is where it is one of the places that gave formation to zionism i'll be talking about that and maybe i'll show you something about that uh it is also uh the place that where a lot of the bolshevik revolutionary members came from so it gave birth to the bolshevik revolution which is basically in if you look at the party num members in terms of religion it was a jewish religion that created the Soviet Union and uh, it was um, the uh, Ukrainian Kiev that gave birth to Zionism. Now to understand the psychology of this you have to understand that why did they think of Zionism? Okay, Why did they think of this idea of having our own nation? It happened because the Khazaris had already established a Jewish territory which was in their view, 
up till this time that this was done an impossibility. Okay, so now that this empire has been established, uh, there are a few things, but one of the most important things is that it gave the Jewish people like, oh, we can have an empire of our own. And because the Khazaris established their own empire and then it dissipated, we'll be talking about that. And then that gave birth to the idea and the possibility that there can be Zionism. See, so Kiev is very important historically for Jews and uh, it connects to the Quran and Surah Al-Kahf. How? Surah Al-Kahf is about fitan. And one of the forms of fitan is fasad. And in Ya'juj wa Ma'juj la mufsiduna fil ard. And Ya'juj and Ma'juj cause fasad in the world, right? And who are these? These are the people behind these Caucasus mountains. How do we know that? We know that because that's what Cyrus the Great did. This is, we know that Zulqarnain is most likely the man mentioned as Zulqarnain in the Bible. He is the man who is historically known for the two horns on his helmet. He is the man who is known to take these trips to the east and the west. And many other things that I don't have time to go into today. But if you connect the dots, Zulqarnain is Cyrus the Great. But that's not the important part. The important part is Cyrus, uh, Zulqarnain put a wall in the Caucasus Mountains. Why did he put a wall? Because to stop Fasad. And so, when that time comes, that Fasad will start in the Caucasus Mountains, in the area of this mountain, a, 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 a nation carved out of mountain, Remember this word because it's going to come in Daniel. And then we're going to talk about Bible prophecy and how they look at Russia. And so anyway, this area carved out of a, an empire, carved out of mountain. This, when you see Fitna coming here, right behind the mountains, that is a clear sign that the Fitna of the Jal has started. Are you following me? First, let's listen to what the Jewish professor says. And it's funny because here it is, the, the capital of Ukraine, and may have been originally a Khazar trading outpost. And this document found once again in this suburb of Cairo um, is a rather unusual document. It essentially describes the tale of woe of the holder of the document and implores Jews to open their hearts and their pockets to alleviate his family distress. And it is signed at the bottom by several important figures um, in Hebrew letters and sometimes with distinctly Turkic names, uh, including this mysterious rune here, the set of runes that says in, uh, in Turkic, I have read it. Now, have you heard of any kind of document like this ever before? You probably have seen these documents regularly. Like when Jewish collectors come to your front door and they bring you a laminated piece of paper, you know, describing the problems this person has and it's signed by members of the Vaad. This is exactly what they found about this Khazarian Jew who was traveling through Kiev. It doesn't say he's trying to make a wedding for his daughter or things like that. It describes some family issues he had to deal with. But this is a really stark depiction of a reality that is still known to the 21st century and uh, argues very favorably for the genuine Hebrew uh, or the Jewish nature of Khazarian Jewry. Uh, this is probably from the 10th century, which would be somewhere in the neighborhood of one to two centuries after the conversion of the Khazars to Judaism. But so many questions. So this is the first clip. So this was a bunch of documents that was found in Egypt, Jewish writings of all sorts, probably the largest of its collection type. And this is one of the letters where a Khazari Jew writes a letter to Egypt, 
to get help and support for his family from the Jews of Egypt. Okay, what is the point here? Why is this important? And how does this relate to Sutul Kahf? Okay, so now to understand that, let us look at this phenomenon of how the Khazari Jews were discovered by the Spanish Jews. And this will tell you the real importance behind this. Okay, so let's do that. So this is about one of the Andalusian Jews who had a very important position, who discovered the idea that the Khazaris have an empire, and this is a big deal for the Jewish people. Because they could have never thought that there would be a Jewish empire. And this is during way back in the Andalusian uh, Muslim Spain. At any rate, one of the early figures in the 10th century was an individual named Chastai ibn Shaprut, who rose to prominence in Cordoba, and he actually became one of the most important ministers within that city, representing the region of Al-Andalus with all kinds of diplomatic correspondence. He was actually a medical doctor, and he, he treated patients in Christian regions as well as Muslim regions. Fascinating things. But at any rate, for our purposes, he was especially interested in learning about far-flung Jewish communities. And he wanted to use the power of his office to try and protect them and promote their interests and to promote Jewish unity. He really thought on a global level. And when he heard about the possibility of Jews living north of the Caspian Sea in the region of Khazaria, he was especially interested in learning out... Learning now, look at this map because this map will make what I'm trying to say a lot easier. You see where Khorasan is? You see where Khazaria is? Okay. Now that you see this, please keep in mind, there are three parties and there are three travels. The travel to where there is no sun is where Afghanistan and Khorasan is. The travel to the Black Sea or to the Lake Sivan, same general area, that is where one group, where the other one group will be. And then there will be, this will be the place where the wall will be placed in the middle between the mountains. And so here's the cure, Khorasan. Here's the enemy. You know who that is? And then in the middle is the place where the battle of the, of a lot, you could say somebody is going to put a barrier for them. And then the cure will come from Khorasan. So first, you know, just like if somebody is hurt, first you have to stabilize the person. Then you cure the person. So this kind of like, there's the wall, because there's facade. And when facade is reaching a certain peak, the wall is placed. So now Kiev, Ukraine, plays a role from that perspective. Now let us continue about this person who was a Jewish man who discovered Khazaria, even though they were already had accepted uh, Judaism. More about them and trying to understand, you know, what is the story with these Khazarian Jews? Now, we'll get to the actual story of the, uh, the conversion of the Khazars shortly. Uh, it occurred about 200 years prior to this correspondence. But just to look at this map here, you can see that Khazaria is located north of the Caspian Sea uh, in the region which would be today Ukraine, especially eastern Ukraine. And uh, it is notable. Now, also notice Kiev. Uh, is right there on the map. You can see it. Okay. So just keep that. It's you know. It, yeah, this is Ukraine. So this is behind the we Darbant, right behind the Darbant wall, right behind that wall between the two mountains. Now I have videos that already explain this in detail. And as you know, I generally don't say something unless I have at least some evidence for it. Okay. So this, you know, in in a scale of one to ten, how sure are you? This gets pretty close to number nine in terms of these historical events as well as the connection with Sutul Kahf. Seems like, oh, wait, this area is important. And this area has to do with Sutul Kahf. Now, this man discovers this, so see what happens now. Think from the Christian regions to the west and the Muslim regions to the south. That will become very significant in just a moment. At any rate, according to the history of the documents as we have them, 
uh, Hastai ibn Shabrut sent messengers out to Constantinople hoping to reach the kingdom of the Khazars. However, when they got there, they were blocked by the local Byzantine authorities who would not allow these messengers from Spain to traverse the territory and make their way up there. And so they were forced to sit tight in Constantinople, which is, by the way, in contemporary terms, uh, Istanbul. So they're sitting there and they passed off their letters and which apparently, according to the story of the correspondence, made their way to Khazaria and a King Joseph read the letters. So there's a big debate amongst Jews and the Jews say it's the anti-Semitic anti people who say, like it says in this uh, newspaper, the Times of Israel leaked report, Israel acknowledges Jews, in fact, Khazars. Secret plan for reverse migration to Ukraine. <coughs> now, this may have some significance or not, but either way, uh, what we will know Quranically, and of course there are some Jews uh, that state over and over again, no evidence of genome, wide data of Khazar origin uh, of uh, Ash uh, Ashkenani Jews. So the point is that, you know, some Jews are going to say, yeah, we may be, we may not be, but we don't know what happened to them. Others say they moved westward. I'm not getting into all of that. What I only want to establish, this is the region Sultan Kahaf points to at the, in, in the story of Sultan Name. This is the area, the area of Khorasan, the area of NATO, and the area of Ukraine. Now, it is up to you to understand why is Qur'an and Sultan Gahaf pointing to these areas in the journey of this man. I also want to add that, what? I want to add that uh, this was really the foundations of Zionism in a sense that the Jewish people would have never thought of a homeland. But uh, when this uh, rabbi and this uh, doctor, Jewish doctor, when he saw, oh, well, we have our own, we have our own, empire we have our own empire when you realized we have our own empire then that gave birth to zionism from the same people of this region you know theodore herzl and we're going to talk a little bit about that but there's another side to all of this does bible prophecy have anything to do with these areas does bible prophecy say anything about russia so this is now going to be the next part of my discussion. So the first part I talked about Zulqarnain and his journeys. I talked about uh, that there was a the journey to the east and the uh, the journey to the the to the Black Sea where the sun is setting, this journey to where there's people who have no shelter and then the wall. That and then what that entails. And now I've talked about the discovery of the Khazari Empire and what that meant for Zionism, and why this location, Sutil is focusing on this location. And uh, so now let me now talk about biblical prophecy and how that plays into all of this, inshallah ta'ala, okay? So now I want to show you Bible prophecy, but before I do, I want you to remember how the Sutil Kahaf starts off with a very strong criticism of Christianity because Dijal is literally because when Dijal comes he has to prove he's the Messiah and to prove he's the Messiah where will he point he will point to the Bible see look at your Bible your Bible proves I'm the Messiah I have fulfilled every prophecy and I'm coming according to prophecy so just keep this in mind so the Bible cannot be trusted and what is very interesting as you'll learn today is that they have the same prophecies, a lot of the same prophecies we do, but they're on the other side of this. So now, for example, for us, for those of you that have been watching me, there are prophecies in the Quran. You will definitely find what those that are most affectionate to the believers, those who they say they're Christians from the Eastern Orthodox Christianity, where they have the monks, where they have the priests, where they are not. <clears throat> too proud so now what does the bible tell us about this area of where the khazari tribe was 
where Zulqarnain locked them in, where the fitna, the facade was, as the Quran mentions. <coughs> so now let's look. Right now, in, 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 in the area of Russia and Ukraine. And when I was growing up, and as I continue to study the Bible, listen to Bible pro uh, professors and prophetic experts like yourself of another generation, they often talked about the army to the north. And I think Rosh was the, was the word that was used in the yes. original language of the Bible. Is that Russia? And should we be paying attention to what's happening with Russia and with Ukraine in light of Bible prophecy? Yeah, I think we should. Uh, the word, yeah, the word Rosh there, Rosh, is used in Ezekiel 38 and 39. And we don't just say that it's Russia because the words sound alike. A lot of people say, well, you know, Rosh sounds like Russia. Uh, there really is good evidence biblically, and when you go back in the language, that this was the area that we know today as Russia. And geographically, it is right. North of Israel. That's right. And it says three times there in Ezekiel 38 and 39 to the uttermost parts of the north. Well, all distances in, in the Bible are always from Israel. So if you go the farthest north you can go from Israel, you're in Russia. And so what Ezekiel 38 and 39 speak of a great end time coalition. There's a leader there called Gog, and that word just means high or exalted, probably his view of himself. G-O-G. G-O-G, -G, Gog. Mm -hmm. And he's of the land of Magog. And these places that are listed in Ezekiel 38 are Russia, one of them's Iran, one of them's Libya, another, several of the names relate to Turkey, which is turning very rapidly back uh, towards the east, towards radical Islam. So a lot of these things we, we see happening in that part of the world, I think, are significant. And with Russia, you know, a lot of people thought that when the Soviet Union fell apart, that, you know, that was all over with. Well, the bear has come roaring out of hibernation. You're not kidding. Say. You're not kidding. And, and that's not an accident. I think we see that happening in conjunction with all these other things taking place in the world. I think it's a, a significant event that's setting the stage. And you're watching nations that used to be under uh, Russian ruler, uh, like um, uh, well, we saw what happened in Georgia. We see what's happening in Ukraine. There's concern in Latvia and Estonia, uh, 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 those, those uh, Baltic nations. Uh, it, it seems to be a realignment as to what we thought during the Cold War the Army of the North would look like. No, that's right. It is. And really what happened with the fall of the Soviet Union has really set things up even better. People thought, well, that's the end of that prophecy, and that prophecy wasn't correct. No, actually, it's come back now and been reformed in a way that's even uh, more compelling and even more in line with what the Bible says. So now let's go to the next uh, person. <coughs> was actually founded. So if you've been watching my lectures, when I say the Judeo-Christian civilization, this is their common, uh, you know, view of the Bible, as you'll see. But what is interesting, that when we're talking about end times, we have end times in Islam, and we have end times in Christianity. And the script that the Dajjal is going to follow is the one in Christianity. And so when we are told, this area of Khorasan is the people that are going to go to Israel. And the people from Russia may help us, or the Eastern Orthodox, not just Russia, but this whole area, they may help us uh, in this, uh, uh, you could say, war against evil. So they have the prophecy that those that come to attack Israel are the people that are Ya'juj and Ma'juj. And they're the ones with the Antichrist. But until then, the state of Israel being made, all the Jews going back to Israel, all those big landmarks, uh, that there will be, uh, tribulation, uh, that there will be, um, you know, uh, earthquakes, that there will be disease, and then there will be famine, and there will be wars, all those things they have that we have pretty much, uh, to some degree. So, they're also seeing the state of Israel be established. We're also seeing the state of Israel established. Oh, okay, it's the same. And they're also seeing, okay, there's uh, disease. Okay, there's disease. There's famine. There's famine. There's wars. There's wars. Okay. All the Jews are going back to Israel. Okay. But that last major piece is completely shifted, turned upside down, turned upside down. And for them, it is, uh, as this other uh, Christian uh, fellow man will say, so, 
Many Bible scholars believe in Ezekiel 38, as it speaks of Magog attacking <laughs> Israel, that that is modern-day Russia. I could go and talk about that for, you know, 30 minutes, why they believe that's true. I happen to agree with them. But it says in Ezekiel that the Jewish people will be scattered and regathered in our land again. We know uh, during World War II, after the Holocaust... Okay, so now, uh, from where did this major shift of the Jews coming back to Israel start from? It started from, uh, the major one started from Russia. Okay, and, uh, the, and that started from Ukraine. And that has the history of that Jewish empire that allowed the Jews to think of uh, Zionism as an option. Okay, <clears throat> but also this area where behind these mountains, the area behind this and what it contains is where a lot of the Fithans are. And that's where the Fithans will come. And that's where it has come. Whether it is now being manifested through the banking systems, through the sanctions of MasterCard and Visa, whether it is, you know, that's the result of trying to put the wall there, right? That, that all that facade that has been built is now coming out. That's one way to look at it. The other way to look at it is <clears throat> they also have this Caucasus Mountains, this in their prophecy, as you'll see. And they also see this as, as, as the, the fitna that comes from here. And what is fitna for me may not be fitna for you, as you'll see. Because the fitna that they are bringing, they, when we come and conquer Israel and free the Palestinians and free Al-Aqsa, most importantly, more importantly, they see that as fitna. And when they're attacking us with their riba system, with their entrapments, with their magic, we see that as fitna, right? One is a trial for the other, and the other is a trial for the other. Now, let's first listen to what this Christian uh, guy says, so that I'll be able to make my point a little bit better. And then hopefully we'll come around back to uh, the whole situation. Record this podcast, one that has uh, an aggressive nature with the current leadership. Um, most people will look at Ezekiel 38 and 39 and say this is referring to a future battle where Russia and a coalition of other nations march against Israel. And some, some people see Magog not as a specific reference to Russia, but more of a general term for the populations of people living in the Black and Caspian Sea area. Um, but no. This is very important. Black and Caspian Sea area. What is around this area? It's Khorasan. What's around this area? Eastern Orthodox Christians. Okay. And so this is the area that the Quran is pointing to. That this is where you have to put the wall. And this is where it will start. And so the wall has to be put where it will start. And then the people of Khorasan, according to the sayings of the Prophet, is the people that will bring the cure, the final victory. It will start in the mountains. The enemies are on the side of that side, okay, the, on the western side of Europe, you can say, on the western side of Eurasia. And then on the eastern side is Khorasan. And then this is where the wall has to be put. Now let us continue. But either way, regardless, you've got portions of Russia and portions of the former Soviet Union that are involved in this battle of Gog and Magog. So specifically, we've got in Ezekiel 38 and 39, a nation coming from northern Asia to attack Israel from the far north, uh, from Magog. And, uh, well, recent events have shown that Russia has been gaining strength and kind of saber rattling uh, in its march against Ukraine. Uh, in fact, this area of Magog could very well include Ukraine uh, and Crimea and some of the other nations in that area as part of the march against Israel again in this future battle. Um, 
So there, there's going to be a time that's coming when Russia will al be in alliance with several other nations, probably including some, some Islamic countries, and they'll march against Israel to plunder its land. So now you see where the for them it's reversed. The army coming to Israel is the one bringing the fitna, bringing the Gog Magog, bringing the Antichrist. And for us, they're the Antichrist, they're the Gog Magog, and we will be going to them to free humanity from their injustices. So this is what Shaitan has done, you know, uh, turn the prophecies around. And why does the Quran point to this geographical area? This is the question. That why does the Quran and then also why does Shaitan, the Bible, or if that is somewhat originally intact from the beginning, why does the Bible point to this area? Why do they, they both agree that these areas are important. And so therefore, when the Jews asked the Prophet wasallam this question, that who is the man that traveled to the east and to the west? And the Quran tells of his travels to the east and the west. And puts it in Surah Al-Kahf, the surah that tells you about the fitna. So, what were the Jews interested in? So now let's investigate this a little bit more. Now I want to leave you with the two points in Surah Al-Kahf that talk about a military confrontation. One is with Zulqarnain when he's putting the wall against the others. And the word is used as facade. And so there is another party that wants to hurt another party and this wall is made. And then the other is in the very beginning in ayah number two. This ba'san shadidan like in the surah before this our servants who will have great military power. So this word, Ba'san Shadid, as you see in the screen, let me show it to you in Surah Al-Isra, also how it is. Ba's means difficulty. If you go literally, the word Ba's means difficulty, Shadid means very severe. Okay, And so Ba'san Shadid would mean severe difficulty. But in the Quran in several places this word Ba'san Shadid in Surah Al-Isra for example translated as great great might. Okay, We will send against you our servants of ours possessing great might meaning great military might. And so the first place where Surah Al-Kahf is, is a great warning that there's nothing, there's no, there's no puzzles to solve. It is as it is saying. All praises to Allah who sent down the book to his servant and he put no distortion in it. Everything is clear. There's no puzzles to solve. As Mr. Hani would make you believe, for example. قَيِّمَ الْنِيُذِرَ بَأْسًا شَدِيدٍ it is straight to the point warning you of a very severe punishment or a very severe military uh, might from Milladunhu, from himself. So Allah will cause civilizations to clash, militaries to clash, and that will be from Allah doing this. And where in Surah Al-Kahf does Allah talk about parties coming together in some sort of clash? It is in the story of Zulqarnain where he builds the wall. Okay. And so the beginning and the end are talking about a clash. And the end is talking about three different locations, who will this clash be with? People on the side of Khorasan and the Eastern Christians. First of all, 
Over even about that, I want to say that, unfortunately, Muslims should be on their own. They should have their own khilafah. They should have their own unity. But because we're weak and we need some time, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has His mercy upon us. And so Allah will give us allies near the area of Khurasan who will maybe help us, inshallah. And then you have where the clash will come from, where the dark, murky water on that side. And the clash will begin in the center, in the mountainous, in the Caucasus Mountains. The Quran and the Bible have some congruency, some level of congruency on this, this issue. And this issue will not stop according to the Bible till it reaches the state of Israel. And Khurasan will not stop according to our Prophet وسلم, until it reaches Israel. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you in the, in the story of Zul Qarnain that it will start here. But it will end in a great military war in which the believers will be finally given victory. The last in the final war. Malhamatul Uzma. The great final war. And the this World War Three is going to be not like one big war where all the countries are fighting. It's going to be a series of wars. Series of wars. Series of wars. There's going to be Kitabul Malahim and Malhamatul Uzma and Malhamatul Kubra. Series of wars and series of issues and series of difficulties, one after the other. And so it has now begun. This is the place Tul Kahaf told us. This is where the wall of Zulqarnain was. This is where the wall was, where this war is now taking place. And so now, a person who reads the Qur'an, and he comes to the understanding that, oh, this is that area where Zulqarnain built the wall. This is the area from where the facade will come out. This is the area that needs to be stopped. What is this facade? This is exactly what I'm going to talk about in my next lecture, talking about all of how this facade of this world is to keep countries under control using the dollar, using, uh, using bioweapons, and so on and so forth. That is what I'm going to be talking about maybe in my next few lectures. And I will be talking about this issue. But first I wanted to give you an overall Quranic view. So now let us start from the beginning to where we came to the end. So everything is clear. The Jews asked a question. Where did they ask the question from their book? Their book mentions Zul Qarnayn. They asked about Zulqarnayn. They asked about the man who brought together two great empires. That is Cyrus the Great. The man whose symbol is two great horns. Or two horns. When the Jewish people asked about Zulqarnayn, over here I want to share something with you about Zulqarnayn, that Cyrus the Great is considered Cyrus the great is considered the non-Jewish Messiah. Okay, Cyrus the Great was the non-Jewish Messiah. He's the one who let the Jews go to the state of Israel from Babylonia, from their captivity. So the point now being that the Jews asked a question from their books to see if he's a true prophet. The Prophet وسلم, got the answer and told them about his travels. But the Quran is coming down for us too. And to tell us that he's a true prophet. And the Quran is telling us that he made three travels to three important destinations. In fact, I've, I have a video on this. There's a hadith of the Prophet wasallam that when Zul Qarnayn went to Khurasan, he did dua there in one of the cities. 
marwa or mari or mar, mar, mari something like this and it exists and i talk about it in their videos the possibility of where this city is so he went to that place khorasan and he went to where the sea sets and he went to the Caucasus Mountains to put in the wall. Those people, a weak people, asked Zulqarnain, can you put a wall here? Because Ya'juj, we fear of Ya'juj and Ma'juj causing khasab. So he put a wall there. That place is where the war now is. And the war is there because why? Now, this is a longer discussion. You have to watch my other videos because Ya'juj and Ma'juj has reached Israel. This is the white Anglo-Saxon Khazarian or non-Khazarian, doesn't matter, white Yiddish-speaking Jews who really don't have much of any relationship with Banu Israel. But anyhow, they adapted the Jewish, you, you know, religion and maybe intermarried into some of them at some point. But anyway, they're now in Israel and they're causing the facade and where are they causing the facade? The same place where Zulqarnain had to put the wall. And so this now war will not stop till it reaches its peak. And so this is some of the basic understanding that is coming to me reading Sutul Al-Kahf and looking at the situation that we're that is before us. If there are any thoughts that come to your mind about the situation about Sutul Kahf and this location and the type of facade being done, then I invite you to, in the comment section, share your thoughts. What do you think is the greatest of these? Is it the biolabs? Is it the financial aspect? Is it their fight against religion, the Orthodox Christians with Orthodox values versus secu you know, secular values? Um, what is it? What is the great facade or the facades that has emerged from here. You can say that one set of facades has come out from England, and now you will see a facade starting from this Caucasus Mountain area, and it will keep going until the victory is given in the hands of the Muslims and Prophet Jesus and Prophet Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. So, inshallah, I hope I was clear. And if there's something I was not clear about, because sometimes when something is clear in your mind, it's not necessary you are able to explain it just as well to other people. So if there was what is clear in my mind, if, I, if it was coherent and logical and connecting with the Quran and connecting with the understanding of the situation, then do dua for me, that Allah guide me. And if you think I'm missing something, then please, in the comment section, this is to become a collaborative effort where we put our minds and thoughts together so that we can, uh, inshallah, uh, be guided. Inshallah, jazakumullah khairan. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.